Hi, everybody. On behalf of the URBC Organizing Committee, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the last in our seminar series uh, for our Understanding Risk uh, uh, BC 2020. Uh, my name is Marie Journet, and I'll be your host today and also uh, participating in the session. I'm coming to you from Squamish, British Columbia, uh, which is the ancestral territories of the Coast Salish people and uh, also uh, home to the Squamish nation. And uh, for those who can join us a little bit later for our closing ceremony, uh, we have the honor of, of hearing uh, from Chris Lewis, who represents the Squamish nation, and he'll be sharing with us some of their traditional stories about living on a, on a powerful landscape that has uh, impacted their community for centuries uh, when it comes to disaster. Resilience, I think, uh, I think that community understands it better than, than, uh, than most. I'd like to uh, start by thanking our sponsors for uh, the URBC series, without whom we, we couldn't put this on. Uh, so a, a, a big shout out to uh, Natural Resources Canada, the Canadian Safety and Security Program for providing the, the core funding for our program, uh, and IBC, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, uh, the BC Office of Housing and Construction Standards, uh, Bruce Geotechnical, uh, EERI, or BC Chapter of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, the BC Real Estate Association, and Engineers and Geoscientists BC. So uh, a big thank you to all of them for their support and an opportunity to, uh, to thank you all for uh, your continued support of our programming uh, through the fall, uh, through the summer and, and fall. Uh, we've learned so much from your participation and this last session will again be geared around uh, hearing from you and engaging with you uh, to get your, your thoughts on, on what we're up to. We uh, have been grounding our work uh, in this symposium around this question of how do we implement the Sendai framework on the ground at a regional scale. Uh, we're focused on the Georgia Basin region, Southwest British Columbia, but I, it's a broader question. Uh, that we're posing and uh, many of you are familiar with the Sendai framework and we've covered it in previous sessions here. Uh, but it's uh, really focused on a set of seven targets, uh, global targets for reducing risk and building resilience. And uh, so this is a bit of our roadmap and, and we'll get into a bit more of it in our afternoon session. But uh, really it's about science policy integration and, and there's three steps uh, and our Presenters over the last couple of months have touched on every one of these. It starts with understanding the risk. Uh, it progresses to using that knowledge to inform uh, the kinds of choices that we can make to reduce risk and build resilience. And that's all in service of, of really trying to identify actionable strategies that can be taken to planning and policy tables to uh, really look for effective ways uh, to increase our resi resilience. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, open uh, the session today, uh, titled Terra Cognita, um, not to be confused with Terra Incognito. Uh, so we hope to bring some light to uh, unknown territory today. And uh, the question we're posing is, how can we accelerate disaster resilience planning with open data? And uh, in this session, we're going to explore uh, the potential for using emerging open data platforms uh, looking at the ways in which we access and use risk information to support disaster resilience uh, here in Canada. This includes the ways in which we collect and share information across networks of people and organizations, but also the ways in which these networks uh, uh, make available uh, this evolving base of evidence to inform uh, risk reduction planning. And really at the heart of this work is a user-centric process of iterative design and development which begins with a very clear articulation of what the information needs are uh, and what are the requirements for supporting those who are on the front lines doing uh, disaster risk reduction planning in our communities, in our regions, and within various uh, jurisdictions. Our presenters for today uh, will include uh, Jost Van Olden, who's an information architect and, and lead of, our, uh, of NRCAN's open data platform. Uh, Janice Sharp, uh, Senior Director of Canada's Federal Geospatial Platform. Uh, Jamie Herring uh, is president of Habitat 7 and designer of, uh, of uh, leading ed web-based web uh, data applications. And he's gonna be steering us through uh, our session after the break. And Aaron Brox uh, representing ThoughtSpot and Patrick Nadeau uh, of DLS will be 
giving us a, a view into the future of where this, uh, where these technologies might uh, might be steering us. So our plan for today uh, is uh, is pretty straightforward. We're going to start with uh, a very short. Uh, setting the stage for context and motivation for this work, uh, which is really responding to the kinds of questions that we've heard in the URBC uh, series over the last couple of years. Uh, so we hope that we're bringing some, uh, some insights and maybe some, some next steps for us as a community. We will be looking at how uh, open data can be leveraged uh, through various channels and ThoughtSpot uh, has been kind enough to, to give us a demo and uh, we'll get to that shortly. Um, Janice will give us an overview of uh, Canada's spatial data infrastructure, the federal geospatial platform, uh, the architecture that, that uh, we are building uh, our applications around. Uh, Yoast will give us an overview of the OpenDRR platform, its, uh, its architecture and, and uh, uh, where we're heading with that. And uh, finally, after break, uh, uh, Jamie will uh, give us an overview of the landscape of these uh, data platforms, uh, risk information platforms uh, from his perspective and, uh, and will guide us through thinking about what's important for you uh, and, and how we take this work forward. Uh, so this first question was, uh, what city, region or country are you joining us from today? Uh, we, we, uh, we may have people joining us from, uh, from outside uh, British Columbia for sure, but I'm, I'm guessing we also have people joining us from outside Canada. Um, so uh, lots of folks from Vancouver, uh, welcome Santa Barbara, um, Victoria, Ontario, Oakville, Ontario. Um, so this is, uh, this is kind of what we're hoping for uh, to see, you know, people joining us from uh, from different parts of, of our country, but also bringing in ideas and perspectives uh, from, uh, from other places and other, other groups that are working on similar initiatives who can bring their insights and, and share with us uh, what they're learning. Uh, so that's awesome. I'll, I'm gonna let the poll continue uh, and we'll kind of keep capturing that. So uh, if you haven't done so, please uh, keep, keep going, but uh, we'll move on. Uh, and many of you have already uh, moved on to the next one. Uh, which is really asking the question, how are you most likely to use risk information? And uh, this is uh, really the start for our conversation is getting a sense of uh, the context in which uh, you would be using risk information, whether it's the inputs, uh, physical exposure models or social vulnerability models, uh, or whether you're looking, you know, whether you would be using the outputs of those models to support uh, various aspects of disaster risk reduction and planning. And uh, you know, from the results coming in so far, we can see that that the majority of folks uh, are certainly you know looking for information, probably the inputs that can be used to support uh, risk assessment modeling uh, to provide uh, information for planning and policy. But we have uh, actually this is awesome. Uh, this time around, we've got pretty strong representation uh, from folks who would be using that information for both general risk communication. Uh, to help build a shared understanding of, of hazards and risks uh, in various contexts, but also from the policy uh, policy world. So uh, these are really important. Uh, we have been working in an, on an ongoing capacity with the emergency planning and um, community planning communities. Uh, so we're happy to see them here as well. So thank you for that. And um, really this is the last question here is, is really, uh, and um, you should see this as you scroll down uh, and move on to the last one. Really the question that we wanna focus on here today. So by answering uh, how you're using the information, uh, what, we, what we're seeing here as we get results is uh, for each of those uh, uses of risk information, we're getting a sense of where the challenges lie. And it's, uh, it's certainly in finding, <laughs> Finding relevant and reliable information, uh, you know, that's an ongoing challenge for all of us. Um, if we're communicating or using this information for policy, you know, understanding what the outputs mean and, and how to be effective in using them is important. Uh, and integrating this information into uh, local context, whether it's a municipal GIS program that's providing service to a community or, or others. So, um, uh, so this is great. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. So imagine a world in which we all had open access to shared information 
and uh, could could envision for ourselves uh, what the landscape disaster risk might look like in our in our communities. Uh, while this may seem like an unattainable goal for most of us uh, working in the field of disaster risk reduction, there are systems and capabilities already in place uh, that can help us make this uh, vision a reality. So just think about, for example, uh, we routinely use our cell phones uh, to access global, uh, integrated global and national weather models uh, to answer simple questions like what we should plan for on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, to plan expeditions over uh, multi days or to plan a flight uh, path into, uh, into different parts of the, of, of the country. Um, so these, are, these are incredibly complex and integrated models that we routinely use every day. And we access massive online geospatial data sets on our smartphones to help us make sense of the world around us and to help navigate uh, pathways in the back country uh, through dense urban landscapes and these applications are making use of very sophisticated algorithms to help us uh, chart the, the most effective routes to uh, where we want to go. So why can't we use these same systems and capabilities to help us think about where we want to go in terms of managing uh, the hazards that we're exposed to, the hazard threats that we're exposed to? It seems like we ought to be able to do this. But there are a number of challenges in front of us. Uh, one of them is information governance. Organizational mandates uh, don't always allow for the sharing, free sharing of the exposure and hazard footprint data that we need for conducting risk assessments and, and therefore providing those insights uh, to communities. But what if uh, these, uh, these applications and, and uh, platforms were open by default and, and this information was discoverable, explorable, and could be accessed uh, by anybody who needed it? Um, so imagine a world in which we had access, more ready access to this information when we needed it. Another challenge is uh, how we describe and encode our understanding of hazards and risk. Um, we don't yet have consistent ways of doing this, uh, consistent data standards or uh, structures for organizing the information. Uh, but what if we had those standards in place? And what if we could adopt best practice guidelines uh, for describing and encoding this information in a way that it could be understood both by humans, but also by machines to make use of it, to uh, infer, make inferences, and help answer our questions uh, around all the aspects of the risk domain. We struggle uh, with information silos. Uh, different uh, protocols for accessing information actually can create barriers beyond the, uh, beyond the, inf the governance, uh, information governance barriers uh, for systems to access this information and make it more readily available. But what if these systems were more interoperable? What if these systems actually uh, had ways of connecting with each other to leverage uh, these, these evolving spatial data sets um, and uh, could bring this information together in a more uh, integrated way? Uh, one of the other challenges that we've heard over the series is, uh, is really around uncertainty, how to make sense of and use the information that's coming out of uh, risk assessments um, at various scales. Uh, but what if we could approach this in a different way? What if we could um, actually engage in the kinds of sessions we're, we're having here today to understand what the needs and requirements were and, and make sure that the solutions that we're coming up with are, uh, are addressing those needs uh, and, and in a way that uh, uh, is, is both informing but empowering uh, the work that uh, people do at the, at the front end. Um, we now have here in Canada, um, we have uh, access to national and global models uh, for all of the hazards of concern. Um, and so here we're just making use of available information to get a picture of our flood hazard uh, susceptibility here. Uh, in Canada, and you can see that it's uh, distributed across, but concentrated in a number of provinces. And each of those blue dots represents uh, a flood disaster event that's happened uh, sometime over the last couple hundred years. The same for wildfire. Our wildfire service here in Canada uh, uses maps like these. Uh, these are hazard threat maps for wildfire to get a sense of where the hotspots are. Um, and again, the dots uh, uh, indicate where we've had uh, major wildfire uh, disaster events here in Canada and 
The chart up in the upper right gives a sense of uh, how we're exposed to those hazards. And the same thing for earthquakes. We have national seismic hazard models uh, and are about to release a, a risk model for earthquakes that gives us a sense of where those hotspots are in Canada. They're not evenly distributed. And uh, if we just look at the number of people who are exposed to significant earthquakes, uh, just count the number of people um, because of uh, the, the density of settlement in Eastern Canada, uh, the, the majority of people are in Quebec. Um, and in BC, but if we ask, if we look at this through a different lens and ask the question, what's the likelihood of those folks experiencing a damaging earthquake in the next 50 years? Uh, the majority of those folks live in, on the West Coast in British Columbia, where we have uh, an active plate margin. Um, so we have a lot of this information. Uh, NRCAN is about to release a, a neighborhood scale earthquake risk model for all of Canada uh, that will provide access to indicators uh, that measure potential impacts and consequences to the built environment and that look at the um, impacts of those uh, physical um, uh, damages and losses uh, through the lens of, of, uh, of people. Like what, what is the strain on, on uh, neighborhoods uh, as a result of those disaster events? Uh, so we're heading toward a, a place where, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, where we hope to be able to share Profiles of risk, uh, well, certainly for earthquake risk, we're in a position to do that anywhere in Canada, uh, where we can identify those hotspots on the ground in any community and, and help uh, bring some clarity to uh, not only what our profile of risk is, but where the opportunities for uh, risk reduction might lie. So again, uh, we come back to this question and I'll, I'll be handing off here to, uh, to Yost. Um, in a moment uh, to help think about how to design solutions around this question. Um, what if we could take the information that we have about hazards and risk in Canada and sit it on top of systems that are already in place to uh, make that information more readily available? And uh, with that, uh, and to help us answer that question, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Yost. Uh, thanks everyone. So Certainly there's a lot of challenges as Maria had highlighted. And so I think just to set the stage for today, I thought it might be worthwhile to sort of have a look at some of the, the underlying principles um, for an infrastructure that supports open science. So if we look at the OECD um, definition below, essentially open science is just making the primary outputs of publicly funded research results, the publications and the data publicly accessible in a digital format with no or minimal restriction. So you can read between the lines, but I think essentially what that is saying is that we need to sort of extend the principles of, of open data, which most of us are familiar with, um, to the entire uh, life cycle of research. So the first, and I would argue core principle is really the principle of user centricity. Uh, so fostering open engagement. So this um, allows for public dialogue and improves public confidence in, in the science. Uh, feedback loop, uh, this enables users uh, to drive their results and you know, to some extent share in the accountability uh, of the science. A user-centric approach, it, it promotes you know, iterative development of ideas so it allows you to um, you know, adapt, adapt to change according to what your users are, um, you know, requiring. The second principle is, is really collaboration. Uh, so leveraging, leveraging diversity and inclusion, you know, to benefit um, from the diversity of knowledge uh, systems and, and perspectives. Uh, building synergies with, uh, with others, that's to leverage the significant advancements that have been made elsewhere and, uh, you know, and help you maximize the, the impact of the science. Uh, reducing duplication, um, you know, collaboration allows you to um, you know, enable a more efficient and effective use of, of resources uh, and research investments. The third one is sustainability. And this will be kind of a core theme as we go through today, uh, but uh, to a large extent, you know, we should be looking at leveraging existing infrastructures. And that just allows us to sort of mitigate some of the issues with platforms, um, either um, losing funding or becoming obsolete, et cetera, et cetera. 
So try and build on the um, on the shoulders shoulders of others. Using open standards, this makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons. Uh, but in the case of sustainability, it's a good idea because open standards have developed over time and they don't change that often. So you can maintain interoperability with other systems over time, which is which is important. Using common platforms. Um, uh, this allows you to maximize available resources and expertise um, and also allows you to sort of streamline the maintenance or draw on a wealth of, um, you know, resources. So an example would be the Global Earthquake Model uh, OpenQuake platform. It's, it's a common platform in this particular domain. And it's got a tremendous amount of um, uh, support and a user community around it. So you, you mitigate some of the risks. Uh, with going with something that's not so common. Uh, lastly is, is openness and, you know, promoting reuse it really allows other people to build on what you've already done. Um, it, it also accelerates uh, knowledge transfers. So it eliminates the delays in sharing and, and reuse of the data. And it also promotes opportunities for, for innovation. So it allows others, partners, or, or, or other third parties that are not directly involved with your science to create innovative products and services and, and to build on existing um, information, data, and software. So I think what I'm going to do now is introduce you to uh, Patrick Nadeau of DLS Technology Corporation. And um, Patrick offered, uh, well, actually, we asked, we asked Patrick if he was able to put together a demo uh, of the ThoughtSpot uh, platform, which is a, a information visualization platform, and he'll go into the details. But we've, um, we had a demo several months ago, and we were quite impressed with it. And so we asked him to try and, uh, to get his team to ingest some of our uh, upcoming uh, data into their platform and, and provide a demo. And so we're going to do that. Pleasure to meet everyone. Uh, obviously, very interesting topic. And as you said, mentioned, yes, and we'd, uh, we'd reached out to the organization um, to his team, I know following uh, obviously some uh, various announcements on some of the objectives that the organization was trying to achieve. And what we felt was some of the work that we've been doing with shared services within the data analytics side uh, would be uh, extremely relevant and useful to the group. And just by very quick way background before I introduce Aaron uh, and ThoughtSpot is that, you know, DLS is a solutions integrator um, headquartered here in Ottawa. And we've been leading several of the major um, cloud and data analytics projects uh, within the federal government over the last little bit. Uh, and that being said, uh, for the last two years, we've actually been leading a very large initiative uh, with a shared services EBAP program on advanced data analytics, integrating uh, Power BI, uh, SaaS, but most importantly, ThoughtSpot, which is what we're going to talk about today, which is a Gartner Magic Quadrant um, data analytics solution. And this, is, uh, this project actually has been quite successful, and it's going to be the first protected B cloud um, consumable service by shared services being offered uh, actually right now. In fact, there's the final elements of it, of the uh, Pro-B guardrails are being put in place. And so essentially what we're doing, we're creating a data cafe for the entire government of Canada to come to and access and leverage data, uh, the best of breed uh, data analytics tools. And uh, in doing so, what we actually did was introduce ThoughtSpot to the government of Canada. And this is actually the first deployment in the GOC by shared services um, to offer this in future as a uh, data cafe, uh, bring your own data type of environment. And um, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, Aaron, who's one of our colleagues from ThoughtSpot, who will essentially is one of their lead solutions engineers, who will essentially be able to give you a bit of an overview and idea of what ThoughtSpot does and how it's different in uh, collecting uh, data and in leveraging it. And the, understanding that the biggest piece about this is all about user experience and ensuring that everyone within a uh, corporate ecosystem can have access to data and use it as seamlessly as possible and as easily as possible without any real training. And, and that's essentially why we brought this technology to the government and why it's being rolled out by shared services uh, in this uh, major new initiative for them. So with that, I'll hand it over to Aaron. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. I know we have people from all over the world joining us. Uh, my name is Aaron Brox and um, I work with ThoughtSpot. So um, 
I'm going to try to explain what ThoughtBot does a little bit by talking a little bit about my background. So uh, while I'm currently a solution engineer working with data and analytics, I haven't always been. Uh, when I first started my career out of university, I had a degree in history, which set me up for a career in call center. And um, I, I found it was a, a, actually a really useful and helped me to improve my public speaking, uh, speaking to strangers for sure. Um, but I also realized it wasn't what I wanted to do long term. And uh, over the course of my career in banks and industry and uh, um, insurance, I became really good at thinking analytically. I didn't know how to write SQL. I didn't know how databases worked, but I knew how to ask questions based upon my subject matter of expertise and typically work with somebody who understood SQL and have them find the data for me, present reports and dashboards. Uh, when my first daughter was born, I live in uh, just outside of Toronto. I didn't want to commute three hours a day anymore. We have the worst commute in the world. That's its own set of disasters that we can deal with someday. Um, and I decided to instead retrain and focus heavily on analytics. And I taught myself SQL and I taught myself cubes. And it took six months, nine months, a year to be able to build the skills required so that I could directly access data and get my own answers out. And for 10 years, I worked as somebody who would work with non-technical users and they would say well what i need to understand is x and i'd go and i'd find it in the data and say well here's your report of your dashboard so about two years ago i was approached by somebody who said aaron you don't have to do that anymore um, and what they said to me was if you have a question over the thanksgiving dinner table and somebody needs to get a quick answer what do they do we all pull out our cell phones go on to probably google there might be some Bing users here. And we punch in a search and get an answer. But the moment that we are dealing with data in a professional capacity, we are still stuck in the newspaper era where we can put in a request and maybe in a couple of days, we'll get a data extract in a report or a dashboard. So what the founders of ThoughtSpot figured out eight years ago was that this model was broken. And I'm sure that all of us work with raw data, data extracts, we load into Excel, we hear the fans spinning in our system that is trying to give us a pivot table or working with absolutely beautiful dashboards. And Murray, I loved the dashboard images you posted showing the locuses of earthquake risk across Canada. Beautiful, large scale images. But what if you have a question about it? So Thought Thought said, well, why don't we just build a search bar that can search on data? And that's what I'm gonna show you today is how ThoughtSpot is working with the government in order to build an open data platform where for data sources, you'll not only be able to see at a high level, but if you have a question that'll help you make a better decision in the moment, you can search the data as easily as you'd search on uh, Amazon or Google. I'm gonna run two scenarios by you. The first one is gonna be based on COVID. And so COVID is, uh, I, it's a sun that sort of comes up time and time again. We've all been launched into, I think that, um, probably everybody on my street has become citizen scientists because of COVID and the, especially, especially the John uh, Hopkins University data set. We've seen that represented in a number of different ways across newspapers, magazines, websites, that type of thing. Um, ThoughtSpot took that data and we said, well, that's interesting. Uh, what if we can stitch that with mobility data? And I'm looking at the states only because in the United States, there's a very solid data set that shows where people's cell phones are moving and keeps track of on a daily basis, how far Americans move per day. And as an index, how that's compared to how they were moving in the month leading up to the lockdowns in mid-March. And what we're looking at here is pretty much what we could probably find in the New York Times. We have our current cases, we have a number of people who have, who have died due to COVID, uh, mobility in our current index. And this is very similar to what Murray was showing us, these high level views. Um, but ThoughtSpot also lets us get down to a more granular level. Here's at a daily basis. Here's, looks like people uh, in the States rest on Sundays and slowly move until Fridays and they have their peak mo movement. And uh, when it comes to actually testing, we see that our testing cases move up and down as well with the week. Um, and this starts becoming kind of interesting, but it's still answering questions that somebody else asked or that somebody thought are gonna be most important to people who are perhaps consuming this dashboard. What if I want to know what's happening in my county? This level of data doesn't support a detailed, fine level uh, view. But if I go to my search bar, I can look at new cases. And let's look at it by county. And I can create the map myself. 
And if I zoom in, I know we're dealing with a lot of people in Vancouver, Victoria. The closest I can get is Seattle, uh, King County, uh, Washington. I'm going to only include King County. And let's look at what their new cases look like daily. So this is since their very first case, all the way up to daily cases as of uh, the 22nd. And let's ask that question. Are people moving around more or less since COVID started? I can overlay on my mobility index. You can see when Seattle went into lockdown, the average movement on the index, all the way to where they are today. And I can ask my own questions. I can see how things are looking I visually, or I can switch it over to a more familiar view if I want to look at it in this more uh, standard setup and export the data. Because if I still want to load this into a pivot table, I still can. So that's my first example of how we can move from this uh, paradigm of relying upon pre-existing reports and dashboards and move down to our raw data. Now, last Thursday uh, was my first time meeting Murray. And he said, Aaron, I've got some data. I'd like us to try to load it in. And what I love about ThoughtSpot is how easily we we're able to take a data set that is one that we want to be able to pre present out to the, the public and turn it into its own search experience. So I'm going to show you the first thing I did was I went in and explored for myself and tried to answer my own questions. And this is that common first experience when we, when any of us who are analytically minded hit a, a new data set. Um, and I'm using this to show the type of data we've loaded in at this point. So we have some census data around our population, how it's grown over the years. Uh, we're also able to build census maps based on floods, cyclones, wildfire, debris. I told Murray, this is a very depressing uh, set of data sets if you're really worried about these things. Um, and was able to answer my own question around earthquakes of which, um, where do we have the, the largest population? And Vancouver, I know we have a lot of people from Vancouver, having an average uh, ground shaking in, in uh, G's of 0.37. Um, of course, uh, uh, Surrey, this is what my wife always says when I talk about moving out west, is we talk about the price of real estate and how much the earth's going to move underneath us. So once again, though, this is based on me asking my questions. And what ThoughtSpot allows us to do is to break away from this. Maybe this is a good start to understand what we're looking at but to break away from this paradigm and said searching on our, start searching on our own. So um, just this past summer, uh, my wife and I were talking about moving to Victoria. We always figured of all the places in Canada, Victoria is seems the best combination of that West Coast lifestyle and not too much cloud cover. So if I wanna go in and take a look um, at Victoria, I'm gonna start by um, given the, what was in the news recently, I want to understand before I move out there what my wildfire risk is going to be looking like. So let's start at the census division level. And ThoughtSpot is my map showing me where wildfire risk uh, really exists throughout the province. Um, pretty strong in the Northern Rockies and down in the Kootenays. But if I zoom in on Vancouver Island, I was really surprised to see that uh, the capital uh, census division has such a high number. It shows up in my heat map. And I decided to drill down into, I have, you can see with thoughts about when I drill down, we're not limited to only particular paths. Anything that's available in the data that's tied in this case to wildfire risk, I can travel to, which is, I only point that out because Murray and I met for the first time on Thursday and to build this all out, I could never have done it uh, if I didn't have ThoughtSpot to help me build these, um, these drill downs for me. So if I wanna go down into my census subdivision, and let's sort this. So here's Victoria. So Victoria has a 1.31. I don't know if 1.31 is dangerous or not. I, I'm an analyst from the banking and insurance industry, but fortunately I can punch in my wildfire threat indicator and identify that, um, let's put that on as to color code, that yes, Victoria is entirely in a high risk area. Uh, but when I look at this, I think it's interesting that Salt Spring Island pops up, which has pockets of low risk area. And I don't know a whole lot about Salt Spring Island. So if I wanna learn more about it, let's go and let's look at Salt Spring Island. And ThoughtSpot allows me to search for any element anywhere in the data. Um, and I can call it my wildfire and see exactly what the, what the, the numbers are. We can put um, descriptions around this. In this particular case, wildfire has to do with the, the, the head fire intensity. Um, 
and start breaking out from here, the various, uh, you know, if I, if I want to sort of map this out, I can put in my latitude, my longitude, and start getting my, getting my map data either on an overhead view or once again, be able to export this so I can load it into my existing files. So the only other thing that I thought was interesting about Salt Spring was um, the other issue that my wife has when we talk about going to the West Coast is the earthquake. And uh, as Murray mentioned, we do have the earthquake, the likelihood of an earthquake. And I can do this for any sub uh, census area or sub, uh, sub area across uh, uh, BC, but I can see here that if we chose to live in Salt Spring Island, that over the course of the next 50 years, there's a 23% chance that we're going to get hit by a uh, by a, uh, uh, a damaging earthquake. And I said to Murray, you know, what I'm really taking away from all this data is that British Columbia is a very dangerous place to live. And he said, Aaron, don't worry about it. This is why we have building codes. So if you're choosing to move to a particular area, or if you're having to plan, uh, do city planning in a particular area, just bear in mind, I'm sure you already all know far better than I do, the importance of the building code in determining what your risk is. So I'm going to pause it there. I actually wanted to take an opportunity to open it up. I don't know, Murray, do we have enough time that we can open up to uh, any questions about how ThoughtSpot works or what else I can search on? Uh, yeah, Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, so if uh, if people wanted, we, we only have a few minutes before we need to move on, but uh, um, if, uh, if people have a question that they'd like to pose uh, to Aaron, please do so in the chat. Uh, you might be, and just bear in mind that we really only had two days to put this together. So uh, we're just working with uh, information for British Columbia uh, right now. So if you have a question about uh, either population growth or your threat to hazards uh, in British Columbia, uh, go ahead and, and ask it. Actually, Aaron, I'll, I'll ask while we're, while we're waiting. Um, so I, I live up in Squamish. Um, I'd be curious, I, I know what my earthquake uh, uh, threat is because uh, I study it every day, but I'd be curious actually to know what, what uh, the wildfire uh, threat is for me here in Squamish. Okay, so the way that I would tend to approach that, just to the way I think about numbers, um, I'll start with wildfire here. And so that gives me a wildfire threat across all divisions. Um, you'll have to, I have to apologize. I know that Squamish is somewhere along, is close to Vancouver. Um, is it a census division or a, a census subdivision? Let's go with the subdivision. Subdivision, Yeah, that, okay. that would be better. So I have a couple of ways of searching in. These are all of the elements I can search on. And for my census subdivision, I can open up this little funnel. And if I type in Squamish here, so, um, and we can pick a particular one or I can pick all of them. Um, is there one in particular that, do you know which subdivision you're in? Uh, let's just do Spain Squamish. Sure. Yeah. So, and I'm gonna flip this over to here so we can quickly see, uh, yeah, so 234.89. And if I wanna understand if that's high risk or not, I'll show on, throw on that threat indicator again. And uh, you are in a low risk area right awesome. now. Awesome. That's great to know. So I won't, I won't invest in the, uh, the roof sprinkler then just right now, right now. Yeah. But more importantly, I suppose, um, I, can you do backyard fire pits? I'm not sure if you're in a low yeah, risk. Actually, uh, you're welcome to come over, uh, any afternoon or evening. Uh, yeah. Hi, Aaron, um, and Patrick, uh, like to thank you very much. I'm going to pass back over to, uh, our, our active host Yoast, but, uh, just a personal thank you for, uh, for giving us a, a window into where we might be going. Okay, next up, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to, um, to Janice Sharp. She's the Senior Director of the Federal Geospatial Platform here at NRCAN. And she'll pre be presenting um, on just giving us a background on, on FGP and some things they're working on. So thank you. Um, thank you participants for inviting me here. This is a really interesting forum that I was not aware of until I was invited. So this is really fascinating and I hope to be able to participate um, a little bit more uh, uh, throughout the day here. So we talked a little bit about, about spatial data infrastructures and, and, and what that means to me is spatial data infrastructures are just like a collection of standards and policies and, and applications um, that a country adopts. And um, the Federal Geospatial Platform is in essence um, uh, an implementation of that uh, in Canada. And I'll explain that a little bit um, as we go along. So today I'm gonna to tell you what is the Federal Geospatial Platform. For some of you, of course, Yoast has been a member of our team, so he's very aware, but some of you may not know what we're all about. 
So we'll talk a little bit about our strategy and, and where we're going. Um, I'll touch a little bit on, on our data and um, a little bit of some of the changes that are happening in terms of our um, uh, data coverage for Canada. And then I'm going to use a little bit of a use case on how we um, leveraged uh, existing, as I heard some of you say, leveraging is really important in the data world, uh, infrastructure and data to support um, the COVID response uh, from a federal perspective. Um, and a little bit about our kind of our cloud and how that helped to mobilize some of our data and our, our, our capabilities to support the COVID response um, and what that means for us in terms of future emergencies. So, um, so just going back to, you know, what, what my organization is all about. So I'm, I'm responsible for um, working with all of Canada's federal departments and agencies who get together to voluntarily, and this is voluntary, it's not mandatory in Canada, to voluntarily publish open geospatial data and share that open geospatial data on our open government website through um, a website you might have seen called Open Maps. It's a very simple uh, catalog based search and discovery portal. Um, so all federal open data, um, eventually what we want to see is that it's available online through a single window. Um, and in essence, that's how we're an implementation of Canada's SDI, uh, adopting all of those standards and policies to enable that to happen. We've been doing this for about six years. Um, and as you know, as you may be aware, we're all working from home right now. So it is actually quite amazing that um, our 100% of our team is able to continue doing the things that we do um, through telework. So a big shout out to all the IMIT folks who made that happen for us. Um, when we set out to establish um, this platform, we had some, some, some big objectives. We wanted to make sure that data was available. So we're bringing data to the decision makers um, and, and expect that they would make more informed and maybe even better decisions. Um, we expected that bringing uh, data to the public domain, and I, and I, I mean, the previous, um, Aaron, your, your example was, was bang on, is it fosters innovation, it fosters um, you know, economic benefits, benefits and industry to develop new tools and look at things in new ways. Um, and, you know, we did expect, and this was back in the 2011-ish timeframe, 2012, um, at a time when government was looking at reductions over, you know, across the board, we were expecting to be able to work more efficiently by kind of pooling our geospatial resources to make this happen. So we launched about four years ago. So that was a long time ago. It seems like uh, it seems like a long time ago. And we collaborated very closely with our open government uh, partners who are not in Natural Resources Canada. They're the Treasury Board um, and are responsible for open government. Um, and they were uh, they partnered with us to help launch Open Maps, which was basically the public view of all of this open geospatial data. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our strategy. So when we um, completed the, the initial project to set up our infrastructure and our standards and get departments publishing data, we needed, needed a, a bit of a view into the future. So we wanted to make sure that everything we did was enterprise. So if we built something, if we invested in something, if we had data, it was for the greater good of the government of Canada. It was not for Natural Resources Canada. It was for everyone to leverage. Um, we wanted to make sure that we considered, as, as Yost mentioned, the client, the user, and that usability was um, at the forefront of our development. Um, we always are scanning the horizon for the best technology. We are not um, solely based on, uh, on uh, commercial off-the-shelf technology or open source. We're a hybrid of both. So we look at what is best to suit the needs of our users um, and the government and choose the best options possible. Um, we're always about bringing on more data. Um, right now we have thousands of data sets uh, in the platform and we're always looking to have more content brought in. Again, voluntary is always a difficult one in government, but we work pretty hard at that. Um, and beyond just making data available, we wanted to make sure that we had the capability to show value for um, the data that's in our catalog of those thousands of data sets. So what? Why does it matter to government? How do we use this data to support priorities uh, in the government? How do we demonstrate visually um, the value of geospatial data? And of course, use that value to support top of mind government priorities. 
And so, you know, when we look at our longer term horizon, this is just a little graphic that we used um, to show where we've come from and where we're going. We are a partnership between uh, government departments. Government departments pitch in some funding to make sure that we have um, a division that can deliver on this open geospatial mandate. Um, we're very much right now supporting cumulative effects. We have been funded um, through our central agencies to be the engine behind an open open science and data platform um, that is really specific to helping the impact assessment community understand the cumulative effects of resource development. So there's a big geospatial component to that and we're providing, we're being leveraged as that um, back end to support uh, what is a new platform that was just launched a couple of weeks ago actually. So you can, you can Google open science and data platform and you should be able to find it. All the geo and the visualization stuff uh, is brought to you courtesy of the federal geospatial platform. Um, right now, we're also onboarding provincial and territorial data so that you can find it um, uh, in a single location. And when I say onboarding, I just want to make sure where we understand that um, our model right now for, for the time being is connection through web services, um, is, is cataloging metadata. It's not a central warehouse of data located on a, in, a, in a server center somewhere. So it's very much a distributed approach. The departments and the agencies and the provinces and territories that own the data also are responsible for the infrastructure to house it and we just make it discoverable. And in all of that, like everybody else, we're migrating our infrastructure to the cloud. Um, and this has been a huge undertaking in government, not an easy one. We've been on this journey for a couple of years now. So this roadmap just kind of gives you a sense of some of the, the directions we continue to engage with partners and look for opportunities to have them leverage what we've been investing in for the past while. We're looking at what opportunities the cloud has. There's so many goodies in the cloud that we don't even know about yet. So we're pretty excited about some of the tools and capabilities that are now going to be available to us and really doing undertaking a, a transformation from a technology perspective. And over time, making sure that we we can um, continue to enable others um, to leverage what we're doing. And moving to geo.ca, that's going to be uh, at some point our new URL. And it's deliberate because we're onboarding those provinces and territories and giving them visibility, giving their open date, geospatial data visibility, taking away that gc.ca, that sort of federal branding and becoming sort of the open data platform for the government of Canada, uh, open geospatial data, I should say. Let's just be specific. So as you know, um, Open Maps right now is our public face. Um, when we launch to geo.ca, that will become uh, a sister um, website to complement the open government website, but really be more um, specific to, um, to the geospatial community and more attractive um, than, our, uh, than our Open Maps site. Um, so right now we have about 3,500 data sets. That's a lot, that's a lot. And that's from uh, about 20 departments and agencies um, and three provinces. And we're onboarding. Our goal is to onboard all of the provinces in the next two years. Um, we're supporting uh, Treasury Board, who's also looking not from a geos perspective, but from an all data perspective, doing the same thing, onboarding provincial and territorial data into their platform. And by onboarding, I mean making it discoverable um, as, a, as a point uh, where uh, the public or companies, organizations can more easily um, find open, open data. And as I mentioned, we're supporting the whole cumulative effects impact assessment regime by enabling geospatial data that's specific to that topic um, to, to feed an open science and data platform. Um, and we've, we're also an implementation of the Open Government Action Plan. We contribute highly to that. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the elements that we've been looking at is assessing data quality that I'm sure is of interest to a lot of folks uh, and working with our central agencies so that federally we can give our users a bit of sense of, of um, the level of quality of the data that they're looking at. Um, and so you can check out the Open Government Action Plan, the last one from 2018 to 2020, to see what kind of progress we've made on that front. And a little bit more on our provincial territorial data integration. This has been a really uh, um, uh, a, a, an interesting effort on our part and something that our user community was very interested in. Um, so we currently, uh, it's, it's all automated. Um, and one of our big challenges, of course, was um, 
was translation. Uh, uh, as a federal government, we have to work with, um, with uh, both official languages. And when we brought in the metadata from the provinces and ter territories, we automated some translation, use some automated translation tools to do that so that we could offer that metadata in um, both official languages. Um, and so it leverages a lot of the technologies that the platform had um, already. And this is again, leading us to this geo.ca, this, this um, idea that it's no longer a federal geospatial platform, but it's really an open geospatial platform so that everybody can find Canada's open geo assets in a single location. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to talk about um, open geospatial data for emergencies. And this is just a little example I found on the internet. But what it's showing is a map from, I think it was 1850 something, um, a cholera outbreak. And it's been enhanced a little bit digitally so you can see what, what we mean. But it is the geography of the cholera outbreak and mapping the outbreak patterns that enabled um, decision makers to see where the source of that outbreak was and kind of narrow it down to one particular um, well in this, in this area. So the use of geospatial data, the point was here is it's nothing new, is essential for uh, emergencies, for recovery, for response, for planning and situational awareness. So when COVID-19 happened, you know, uh, back in March, it seems like so long ago, it was almost 10 months ago, um, the Public Health Agency is a fairly small organization um, with not a very large uh, geospatial ca capability. So they reached out to Statistics Canada, who has a lot of um, socioeconomic data um, that would help uh, inform, as well as um, the Federal Geospatial Platform because of our expertise in geospatial data. And we all came together and our assistance was re requested to help the agency better map the situation for Canadians. Um, they really needed to, you know, there were a lot as, as someone has mentioned before, there's a lot of um, dashboards and maps being published out there, mostly from organizations scraping data from the internet. But the Public Health Agency had a responsibility to be able to put out dashboards and information that they could stand behind that were sort of validated by their epidemiolo epidemiologists and something that their chief health officer could stand behind. So when we came and, uh, you know, as a group and brainstormed all of this, we knew that we needed departments to be be able to come together in a cloud enabled environment that was reliable and highly available and scalable. So we've been at this for a while, right? Like de migrating our, our geospatial infrastructure um, to the cloud. So these are some of the elements that um, we put together in a fairly short amount of time. Um, first of all, ensuring departments had access. And this is, a, this is a key because the way the cloud has traditionally been implemented in federal organizations is vertically structured. So every single of the you know, hundred and something federal organizations have individually been implementing their cloud infrastructures and closing that off to other departments because of security reasons. But what we needed was something different. We needed organizations to be able to come together, have access, be able to access data, stand up products and tools um, in a shared environment. Um, the idea of, geo, of data lakes came together as well and to ensure data could be manipulated and transferred and used by all of those collaborating. So the idea is have the data in one space with lots of users. Um, mapping infrastructure as well, uh, ensuring that you know, there was a, a availability of the software and the tools um, by Esri and others needed to create the products that were created um, and enabling us to buy those licenses once or leverage the licenses once and not replicate those licenses across multiple organizations. And also enabling uh, powerful workstations and again, investing in those things that are used at the time and then letting those things rest and not incur costs when they're not being used. And that's the beauty of the cloud environment. Um, and so very much trying to ensure that um, uh, users could store and discover the data and adhering to uh, you know, a number of principles that we'd all already established. Um, enabling the users to create the products and services that were required of them. And, but, and, and uh, at the forefront of all of this was enabling departments, multiple departments to come together and share in a, in a single environment and have that environment be, environment be easily stood up quickly and highly reliable. So the results. Um, 
uh, you've seen these dashboards, I'm sure. Uh, sometimes when Dr. Tam does her uh, media releases, she's got some of these dashboards behind her. And um, it is thanks to all of these people coming together. And I, I'm not taking credit for, for, for any or all of it. It is really a collaboration between departments enabled by technology um, that enabled us to have these products be reliable, be able to be published within days of everybody now in a work from home situation. Um, and, and you know, enabling those epidemiologists to be able to stand behind uh, the data that they were publishing. So what we've learned from, from all of this is, is that we know that geospatial information and maps and, and cartographic representation are, and technology solutions are really all essential to managing emergencies. And for COVID, this has really not been any different. But we also know that the type of collaboration and coming together of all of these responders is, a de is very much dependent on technology, on infrastructure, and on shared tools and environments. And we feel that as, as government, we need to do better in this domain. We need to pave the way. We need to take all those barriers, those silos of individual departments, break those down a little bit, um, and enable uh, those collaborators to come together think less along the lines of our departments and more along the lines of Canadian citizens um, and build capacity and literacy in, in geospatial um, use um, and transfer our knowledge to others in, in the emergency in the risk management field so that they're better enabled with the tools that we have at our disposal. And, and we feel that we really need to do this now before the next emergency because we know there probably will be one uh, as history will, will show. So just a few words to conclude, um, you know, we the, the platform has always been a whole of government approach. Um, and although the whole of government approaches shift and morph over the years, still fundamental, it's about collaborating and enabling uh, as a community. Um, it's about investing um, once and enabling many users. It's about ensuring that there's a single source of authoritative data for all and that this data is highly accessible. Um, and being able to reuse the capabilities that we're, um, that we're investing in. So not necessarily, um, uh, you know, when we say leveraging, we mean identifying those wins and those successes from a technology and data perspective and building on them and expanding them and investing in them um, to make sure that they're serving uh, the greater good. And so I think that is all. So I had a couple of questions for discussion if anybody's uh, interested in chatting with me for a little bit, if we have time. So we're always interested in hearing from you as a community. Um, this is, um, this is a, an area that we've always been interested in, but the, the unfortunate uh, situation around COVID really accelerated our interest and our, our desire to bring geospatial technology and data to the forefront and support the, 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 the emergency management community. Um, and we'd like to hear what your needs are and what your thoughts are from, from this perspective. So thank you. Thank you very much, Janice. Okay, so just very briefly, the stated objective of the OpenDR platform is really just to provide tools and facilitate decision-making prior to, to a crisis. We had, there are several motivations that are driving the architecture that I'm about to, about to describe. One of them is an internal policy of the government of Canada. It's the policy on service and digital. And so this, this is very, um, uh, Janice has touched on some of this and I touched on some of this earlier, but the, the core principles are designing with users, you know, iterate and improve frequently, work it open by default, use open standards and collaborate widely. That's sort of table stakes this day and age for any open data project. The other big motivator for us is the Open Science Initiative. So we've actually been called the task to deliver on this in, in 2022, 2023 fiscal year. And so this is, you know, enabling sort of an infrastructure that will allow all of the government kind of scientific articles and publications to be open, open by default. And again, just back to my um, the opening session, when we're talking about open science, um, in, in sort of the open data space, we're actually talking about all of the elements of research from data collection to processing to storing data and results, uh, the long-term presentation, uh, preservation, uh, publication distribution, and, and the reuse. The primary users, as we see them currently, 
um, risk analyst. So these are the folks that are generating scenario outputs. Uh, they are providing these outputs to others for peer review, and then they're uh, sharing these uh, sharing these outputs. We have planners and emergency managers, and so they need access to the data hazard scenarios, access to scenario outputs and data sets, and they need to integrate these into you know an enterprise GIS or a desktop GIS. Then we have the individual and business. This is our public user. So they, they have different needs. They need sort of an intuitive and context to where access to, to hazard scenarios. So, <clears throat> excuse me, very uh, not too dissimilar to what um, you know, Aaron had presented with us with the thoughts on platform. And so they need a very high uh, level overview of risk and they need natural language descriptions and visualizations. So as we move through the deck, if, 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 you, um, if you can, sort of put yourself in one of those primary user roles, you'll see that the, the icon and the colors are represented through the, through, the, uh, through the presentation. And then at the end, we have some questions to get a sense of sort of, you know, did we hit it right? Uh, are, we, are we targeting the primary users in the right parts of the platform? So just pay attention as we move through. So the workflow that we're supporting, um, pretty standard. Uh, so we've, we've got risk analysts that, that uh, model scenarios, they generate scenario outputs. Uh, these outputs are reviewed internally and externally, and we refine them as required. And then we publish them and share them through various channels. The, there's a lot of moving parts, um, but I'd say the, the sort of the four key components that we're going to focus on today is the, the OpenQuake engine. Uh, a GitHub repository, uh, the, the FGP, which uh, Janice had just presented, and a public portal risk profiler, which we'll look at um, after the break. So the first component being the OpenQuake engine. So this is GEM's uh, Global Earthquake Model State of the Art uh, software. And so it's been collaboratively developed. There's, a, a, um, I'd say, a global user group. Uh, it's probably, I'd say, the, the standard sort of platform in this domain. And so it's, it's, in our case, it's generating the raw scenario outputs for, for further processing. And our risk analysts internally, so that'd be Murray and, and Dr. Tegan Hobbs, they're, they're pushing you know, the outputs of OpenQuake into, into our GitHub repository. So GitHub, uh, it's really our sort of public space right now in the internet, and um, it, it works really well in this particular use case, because it's it, it facilitates peer review and editing in in a, in a synchronous and asynchronous way, depending on how you want to interact with uh, with the data. And so there's this concept of private repos and public repos, and so you, it gives you fine grained access to to scientific outputs um, and allows you to share them, you know, more broadly or publicly through a bunch of different um, technologies. So really great collaboration platform. Um, I think initially it was thought of as managing software code, but it's actually works really well as, a, as also a, a, a document collaboration platform. So there's a fork, uh, fork it model. Um, so again, you, you could you can go to our repo and you could make a copy of any of the any of the data sets or any of the software or any of the assets we develop we develop for that matter. And make your own copy. You can edit it, and if you think the results would be relevant to to the community, you could, you know, do a pull request and and submit those back to us, and we can review them and bring them in. So it does provide a great feedback loop too. GitHub has a lot of tools for interacting with the community, and uh, obviously this promotes transparency. Everything we do is on is is on GitHub, including all of our project management. So I encourage you to visit our GitHub repository, and I'll provide the uh, the URL to that at the end. So for the next uh, slide, I'm gonna just pass it over to my, uh, to my colleague, Drew. Right, hi everybody, my name is uh, Drew Rotherham. I'm with the uh, tech team for the OpenDRR and I'm working with uh, Yost and Marie and, and Tegan on uh, generating some of these uh, earthquake risk models and, and making them uh, into actionable spatial information. So we've got a collection of tools that we've dubbed uh, Model Factory and um, at its core, it's a collection of SQL scripts and, and Python scripts and uh, that wraps everything up into PostGIS databases and um, API services. Um, so 
what it does is is um, we've got it configured to automatically um, uh, ingest new earthquake scenarios when they're generated by the the risk scientists from GitHub. Um, we do some data validation, some data ingest, and we um, turn that in uh, that information into uh, Sendai indicators or or views that are more um, make more sense to to human beings than than the raw um, earthquake models. Um, and then we index those from spatial database into an API service so they can be consumed by, um, by uh, other, other um, services down the road. Uh, we do different aggregations. Uh, so we do things at the building, neighborhood level, uh, or uh, wider, um, more coarse spatial resolutions. Um, one key thing that uh, um, we incorporated into, into the development of this was uh, in the spirit of, of open science and, and open government, um, we're developing this uh, completely in the open as a public repository. So you can go to the, the URL, you can go to our GitHub repo, you can um, see all of our developments uh, all in the open uh, in real time. So we've been working on this for about, uh, say 10 months or so, and it's, it's a work in progress, but um, anyone can, can go and, and see the development of this. Um, you can clone it, use it yourself to, uh, to transform your own open quick models. And, um, yeah. So you also pass back to you. We intend on, on sharing deployable solutions on GitHub. So the source code plus we containerize a lot of the components so you can in with using Docker. So you can go in and stand up any of the infrastructure components that you like. And uh, we actually offer the full OpenDR uh, stack as a, um, a Docker Compose uh, file. So you can stand the whole thing from, from the raw um, outputs right up to, to APIs and, and, a, uh, and a dashboard. So there'll be software code, all the documentation will be there. It's all gonna be version, versioned and managed and uh, we'll provide code samples where possible to connect to the various different components. So again, it is, it is live. You can find it at uh, github.com open DRR. And uh, so this is a, obviously changes almost on a daily basis. And so the pinned repositories are sort of the key ones that we, um, the ones at the top that we think people are most interested in, but uh, there's a fair number of repositories now, there's 29. And uh, so I encourage you to go there and, 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 uh, and visit, have a look. And if you have any questions, then, uh, then please reach out. The, I guess the really the core, one of the core pieces uh, for us and one of the more important pieces is the FTP and it's, it has, um, you know, Janice described it as kind of like the, the geospatial clearinghouse for government of Canada. And so for us, it was, it just made sense because it was sort of turn, you know, turnkey services, enterprise grade turnkey services uh, through their geo community cloud offering. And, um, you know, this, this allows us to sort of focus our, um, you know, this goes back to what I said this morning, that it, it allows us to focus our resources, you know, um, our limited resources elsewhere on exploring other things if we have these other uh, infrastructures that we can leverage. Um, and as Janice said, it's, it's, the, it's the primary path for geospatial data within the government of Canada to the open data portal. So we want everything that we've, we're generating data-wise uh, to be available uh, to Canadians more widely. And so um, the path to, to that portal is through the FGP. Uh, again, sustainability was the big driver for us. So our project is five years. So we're eventually going to see the sunset, but FGP is going to be around for a very long time. And as uh, um, Janice had mentioned, there's a, a public FGP coming soon. So the, the Canadian uh, geospatial platform. And so we expect that our data is going to live in one of those thematic sort of boxes and, and perhaps it's going to be called the emergency beam. I think the other thing worth mentioning here is that um, this is also the path to getting our data that sort of indexed and made available in other portals. So federal, provincial, and territorial uh, portals, which we also see is very important. Uh, we have an experiment running right now. Uh, we initially developed this just for internal, internal review, uh, Q and A, if you will, on, on top of our data sets. And so we, we're gonna experiment in laying some of these out in the wild. Uh, the final platform yet to be chosen, but um, the, the idea is that we would be providing pre-generated dashboards and visualizations uh, will allow users to slice and dice the data however they want um, and, and export those results uh, into, say, a PowerPoint presentation or a scientific document or what have you. 
So we're expecting this to be uh, available next year. So riskprofiler.ca, it's, it's our public facing portal for hazard risk. And so this is currently in a design phase. So after the break, uh, we'll dig into this a little bit more deeper, how that design process is going to work and, and what the expected results might be. So it, it, as I mentioned at, at the front end of my presentation, this is the purpose-built web application for non-expert users. So the image that you see there is actually a, an image that we had just uh, cobbled together with what our expectation is for the level of usability. But I would say that, that that's likely to change you know, perhaps significantly uh, through this next round of design. And so uh, interactive maps, graphic visualizations with supporting text, that's kind of what we're, uh, what we're looking at. So this shows us the whole, the whole platform. And again, I'll point everybody to the, to the icons uh, and the colors associated with the different uh, users. And so I think we have some questions coming up, uh, Murray, on the, on the Menti poll. And it's really important for us to kind of understand where you see yourself uh, in the universe of what we're creating here. So if, if we really missed a boat, um, for example, if the, if the dashboard is, is something uh, that a, a emergency planner likely is not using, we would like to know that. Uh, the FGP is currently in, internal, but keep in mind that there's going to be a, a public uh, version of that. So um, think about that as well when the, when the questions come up in the uh, in the menu. So thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, and thank you uh, for those who are uh, taking the time to fill out the poll. We, we really appreciate it. We got about half of us uh, engaging in the polls, and um, that's, that's awesome. Uh, and you can see... Uh, from the poll results that we got over the break, uh, uh, we, we were want to get a sense of uh, your level of expertise, how you would rate your level of expertise, which if you think about a mountain bike trail or, or something else, uh, could be black, could be blue, could be green, and, and really the expertise was your knowledge and skill level. And you can see we've got about a, um, an average of about 2.7 uh, with people having a variety of, of uh, uh, skill levels in terms of accessing information. Uh, manipulating it in, in tables and spreadsheets, um, a little bit stronger on the, uh, sorry, a little bit weaker on the data analytics side, uh, InfoViz, um, and, uh, but, but good strength in map visualization and analytics uh, in this group uh, with less experience in, in programming. So the, um, some of you have already filled out this question, uh, we, but we only have nine people that have filled out this question so far, but, but uh, here we wanted to ask, based on what you've seen so far uh, in both Janice's presentation and also in Yost's presentation about the Federal Geospatial Platform and uh, our work to build an open DRR, uh, open science uh, platform over the top of that, um, where do you see yourself most likely connecting to risk information uh, in this platform? And um, uh, it could be uh, that you're, uh, a, a consumer of raw data, that you want the raw outputs from the models. Um, so you'd be down there in the GitHub uh, category. Um, could be that you're technically a very uh, proficient, uh, want to build your own dashboards. Uh, so you might be up there in that elastic, uh, elastic search uh, number two. Or you might be um, uh, less familiar or less comfortable with those technologies and you really just want to access the outputs either through uh, the services that the Federal Geospatial Platform are providing, which are many and many connection points uh, to get to that data, um, or it could be through a, a purpose-built web application, which we're going to talk, uh, talk about very shortly. Um, so we might still be having people on break, uh, but this is kind of what it looks like so far. Um, in first place, uh, a lot of people imagining that they would access uh, this information uh, through provincial and territorial portals that are connecting uh, through our FGP uh, to access the outputs of, of work that we're generating. Uh, in, a, in a close second place right now is Risk Profiler and it'd be fun to do this after we get finished uh, this next round to see where we end up. But uh, in second place is Risk Profiler. Uh, oh, now moving into first place. Uh, excellent. Uh, this is the horse race that we wanted to see. 
um, with uh, actually quite a few folks uh, looking to access raw data from the GitHub uh, uh, repositories uh, themselves. And uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Yoast. Uh, we are super excited to be, uh, have you with us here uh, for the second half. Um, this is really what it means to do user-centric uh, design. And uh, we are thrilled to be here with you, uh, to hear from you. Um, and uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Yoast to introduce uh, the second half. It's an honor actually, and, um, and really a privilege, I think, for us to be able to, to work with, uh, with Jamie Herring from Habitat7. So Jamie's the president and lead UX designer, and he's uh, going to be leading the design uh, process for riskprofiler.ca. So we're very excited to have him on board. Uh, recent projects that they've worked on, um, which some of you may be familiar with, is uh, climatedata.ca, which, uh, as we know, is just a fantastic, uh, fantastic site. So, again, super excited and uh, warm welcome for Jamie. Jamie, can I pass it over to you? Yeah, please. Thanks, Yust, and, and thanks all for, for joining. Really, really appreciate the time. Um, yeah, we're really, really excited about, uh, <clears throat> about Risk Profiler and the impact that we think it can have on uh, on risk reduction and, and you know as we all know um you know the number of number of risks <clears throat> that we face not the least of which is is climate change um so i think you know the when when houston murray first approached me about potentially working on this i was really really excited about it because i i, I do think the um you know bringing all these different risks together into one place it's easily accessible for people to access and understand um i think can really uh, help us de-risk our, our systems, especially in light of uh, of the changes that we're seeing and 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 the kinds of changes we'll we'll see in the future. So, um, yeah, anyways, really, really, really happy to be here. Um, so, what we're going to do today um, is go through some of that user centric uh, design uh, thinking um, and really hope to leverage some of your all, like all your knowledge and, and, and your input. Because at the end of the day, you know, uh, what we build needs to be useful for you all. Um, and so, you know, our, our targets and our, our, um, our requirements really are, are to help meet, uh, meet your requirements and your needs. So what, what I want to do right now, and, and this is maybe take us 10, 15 minutes or so, um, just go through what it means to do user-centric design, sort of what that process is, and give some samples of the kinds of things that could be done, right? Um, but really what, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to figure out is, you know, if you sort of think of, of a Venn diagram um, with the folks working on, on risk profiler on one side, and then you all as sort of the user community on the other side, um, like what's that overlap in terms of workflows, in terms of objectives, um, and outcomes that, that we all collectively can do. Um, and that's really where we want to want to focus the, the design and development of risk profiler to make sure that the uh, you know those overlapping um, outputs and outcomes that we that we share can be delivered through through the web. And so risk pro profile can really become a tool that's useful um, in, in a day-to-day -day context. Um, so just a little bit about us um, you know before we jump into the process, um, so, so as you just mentioned, um, you know, we're, a, we're a web design development company. Uh, we're based in Ottawa, Canada. Um, and we've been working with, uh, you know, a whole number of different organizations over the past 10 or 15 years um, to really come up with uh, and develop uh, user-centric tools. Um, mostly it's been around issues of risk, a lot of it around climate risks. Uh, but the, that risk landscape is something that's been really central, uh, central, central to our work and, and central to our thinking. Um, so we've been working, you know, with a number of different groups. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the climatedata.ca is, is really one of the one of the pieces I'm, I'm most proud of. Um, absolutely. Uh, but we've been working with a number of different groups, both uh, in the states and Canada, um, and really around the world, um, trying to come up with systems that can help people. Um, you know, leverage leverage data, um, whether it's environmental or sustainability related uh, kind of data and data systems. Um, so, yeah, so, so a few principles of user centric design, and, and this is where, um, you know, I expect our work and hopefully our conversations to expand and extend way beyond, you know, this is this this is hopefully the, the start of a conversation 
um, with all of you um, around the table to help us understand what the requirements and the design requirements are for, for the system. So if you look on the right hand side there, so, so, so the steps of design, um, you know, so the steps of production going from, you know, hey, we've got this idea to we've launched something. Um, there's kind of these five main steps. And obviously within those steps, there's a million sub steps and sub steps in between there. But generally speaking, there's sort of five areas. Um, and then the first is really defining those use cases. And that's something I think we can start, uh, start our journey uh, today um, with, with some of the feedback. Um, but really it's understanding like why, why would someone use this, right? Like, like why is this valuable? Um, and, and you know, in what sort of workflows can this be integrated into uh, to maintain that value and continually um, uh, provide, provide information and valuable insights. Uh, so, so those are the use cases we start with first. Once we do use cases, then we get into wireframes. And wireframes are really, you know, sort of describing them as a really ugly design. Um, it's mostly just like boxes and, you know, with the showing where the buttons would go. Um, we purposely make wireframes really, really ugly. That we don't want people to mistake the wireframes for the design. Um, but it really is about form and function. Um, and this is an area where I think if, if there's some people around the table here that are willing to engage, um, this is an area that could be really, really helpful and, and useful for, for, the, for the group as a whole to get feedback on. Um, it's, it's iterative, we can, we can keep doing wireframes over and over again, keep changing things around. But it's really starting, it's almost like, a, you know, think about building a house. You know, you don't go straight to building the 3D model with the color of the paint. It's you start off with line drawings and, you know, the size and you sort of move around rooms and stuff like that and figure out how many doors it's going to have and how many windows and is it have a garage or not have a garage, whatever it might be. So that's like that wireframing stage. Um, and then, then once the wireframes are, are kind of locked, um, then we go into design. And the design is really not about function. It really is about look and feel. So the, the colors and the, the fonts and, you know, the, the sort of design approach. So what, what something looks like uh, at, at the end is that phase. Um, and again, that's a really good uh, area to get some feedback on. Um, again, we're not really talking about functions. We're really talking about like, does the look and feel speak to you and speak to you as a user um, more than anything else? And then and then, it's, then we get into development and that's just like actually building it out, um, you know, both in the front end and the back end and then, and then obviously the, the launch. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so the main principles as we sort of go through these phases, and, and I think that in terms of input, um, as I mentioned, the wireframing stage is probably the most critical, um, as well as the use cases. So, so these early stages are really, really important. Um, and this is where we would expect and, and, and hopefully ideally have a lot of input from you all. Um, but it's, it's an area that we focus on um, really, really strongly. Uh, just because we don't want to spend money or time on developing things that just aren't going to be useful. Um, you know, so um, part of that, and, and we'll have some questions sort of at the end, but sort of as, as you start thinking about risk profiler, um, you know, I was just reading this this morning, actually, the, the, a different design crew wrote, wrote a bit of a manifesto, which, which I agree with. But there's this idea that, you know, uh, a system has to do something really, really well, right? And if you start thinking about a hamburger, you can add all kinds of stuff to a hamburger, right? Um, but when does a hamburger is no longer, <laughs> when does it no longer become a hamburger, right? Or what are the essential components of a hamburger that makes it a hamburger, right? So clearly if you don't have a hamburger in the middle, you don't have a hamburger. So, so I know that sounds kind of stupid, but it's like, it, 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 this is what it means that we got to focus on the thing that this is going to do. And, you know, we can go down rabbit holes. And I think this happens to a lot of projects um, and a lot of projects we get brought into um, is like, you know, we, there's a laundry list of requirements, you know, there's hundred things or 200 things, 300 things it has to do. Um, and, and you can go down a massive rabbit hole of, oh, we need this function and that button and this, blah, 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 spend years and years and years doing that. And then end up literally with nothing, um, as opposed to, Hey, let's focus on, on key functions and let's nail those. Let's, so, so this whole idea that, you know, less is more, um, they're really, really honing on that. So, you know, what makes a hamburger a hamburger? Well, it's a hamburger. Or what makes Uber Uber, right? Is like, well, Uber is no longer Uber if you can't get someone to pick you up, right? Uh, you put in your your location, a car shows up. If that doesn't happen, 
all the other forms and functions and features that are in Uber is just like is no longer useful. So, so this is the, you know, but, but getting at that sort of that, that those key functions is something we need to work on together. Um, and, and you guys as, as sort of experts in the fields and the actual people we want to connect with, you guys are going to know better than we do, uh, like full stop. So that's, that's part of the, uh, the process that we'd, that we'd like to undertake. Um, so before getting into that, and we've got sort of some, some critical, some critical questions we want to start with. Um, but what we, what I want to do is go through a little bit about uh, a, a couple key sort of concepts just to just to make sure we're on all on the same page. Um, so as we start building out these quote unquote data portals, and I, and I should say I really hate the word data portal. It's like everybody's building a data portal. Um, most data portals are built for the people that are designed for the people who build them, and nobody uses them. <laughs> so it, so so. But anyways, we're, we're building something that has data, right? We're, 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 we're delivering data in a certain context. And there's different types of, of that kind of delivery. And, and really, the, 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 those types of data um, coincide with the technical expertise of the group, right? We were trying to target. So, so you can have visualizations. Um, I'll, I'll show some examples of those. Uh, but you know, by, by that, we mean you know, like a map or a graph. It's pretty static. It's not something you're playing around with. It's like... Here is, uh, you know, the historical risks, or, or here, here's where historically earthquakes have been found in Canada, right? It's just a map. It's got, you know, some some lines around it, some circles or whatever, showing highlighting different spots. Uh, that's that's a visualization, but it's not something you're playing around with. You're not doing any manipulation. So someone like me, who's not super bright, can take that and put it in a presentation and be like, hey, check out where earthquakes have been, right? I don't have to do any manipulation, nothing. Um, so the second, you know, and they sort of like, as you, as you sort of go up in terms of the complexity of the data, uh, it requires more technical expertise. So, um, you know, if, if the data delivery type is a CSV, um, you know, that's still something pretty, pretty basic, right? It's just sort of a, um, a, a table with, with some data and you can put it, bring it into Excel. If you want to do some, some basic functions on that. Um, that's something you can do. So you can do some level of data manipulation, but it's, it, you know, it's pretty basic, um, but requires some expertise, but not, you know, you don't have to be a data scientist to do anything with that. Um, and then sort of the, the API, so the application programming interface um, is, is really a machine to machine sort of system, right? Where, um, uh, you know, something needs to be brought into an operation. So, um, you know, for example, if you're, if you're, if you're a manager and there's sort of short-term data, you always want to be kept abreast on into your systems. Um, you'd want to hit an API, right? But it's just, it's a machine to machine sort of, um, uh, uh communication. Um, and, and it really is sort of systems or uh, operations based, uh, type of, um, type of interaction. So we all know what a visualization looks like, but just to be, to be, to be super clear, um, you know, this is the type of thing. So this is, this is a project we did uh, with Enercan, actually, the, uh, the changing climate dossier. So this is the, the Canadian climate assessment. Um, but they have a lot of, of visualizations, right? Um, just maps. You can't really do much with them. You can download them and put them in a presentation, but it's pretty static, right? Um, and then we've got sort of CSVs. I mean, we all kind of know what a CSV looks like, I hope. Um, but really, you know, it's sort of being able to download the data associated with the graph. Um, this is a particular one from climatedata.ca. Um, but here, you know, you, you can look at the historical averages and then and then climate projections, right? In, in a, for, for a single location. Um, all right, thanks, Mary. <laughs> Got it. I'll whip through it. Um, and uh, yeah, and then and then an API access is is something you know more akin to this, right? So. Where you're building, you're actually building queries, but those queries are for machines to talk to other machines. Um, so that's that's um, that's the the ranges of data types. Now, um, so so yes, yeah, so, so once we get into the actual questions, uh, we'll be wanting to ask you, you know, what you guys think is is the most relevant uh, for the work that you guys need. Is it is it just straight up visualizations? Do you want something to actually play around with and, and, and create an export? Or is it, you know, I, I want to bring this into my operations and, and do API access. So, so and I won't, I won't actually get into these two too much, but um, 
you know, based on those answers, there's kind of, again, a range of data portals, quote unquote, that we, that could be created. Right. So, so changing climate.ca is a great example of, of data context. So it provides, it provides an image with text content to, to really contextualize what that image means. Right. So, so it assumes, and, and sort of this graph here, so as you go down, um, you know, this, uh, this range here, um, you know, really increases expert, you know, the required expertise really sort of increases. So, you know, is it, is it something that is pretty basic where it's like, here's a map, we're going to explain to you what this map means, right? It gives you all that context. Uh, ClimateData.ca, I think, does an excellent job of data visualization. Uh, doesn't give you a whole bunch of context, right? Um, and so just really quickly, I know we're, we're running out of time here, um, but the examples here are, um, you know, you, you can sort of select a variable, um, you can go into a map, um, and you can kind of play around with that map, you can zoom in, you can get data for a particular location, um, but it's not giving you that much context, right? It's just sort of giving you the data. So it, it presumes you know a lot about the data you're looking at. Um, but this has been really successful because the, the audience that this, this, is, this is hitting, they know what these graphs mean, they know what this looks like. Um, and then, um, you know, sort of data, data manipulation, this is really like where people are going in. And here's an example of a, a crop based tool, but you can go in, you can sort of make your own, um, you know, manipulate your own uh, shape file here and it gives you data, right? And it gives you all kinds of different data. You can choose different variables. Um, I guess I can't do that without paying for it. But um, you know, you can choose your own variables. You can really start manipulating, manipulating the system, and start making queries. And this is a bit more, I think, more along my thought spot was was showing as well, where where you're doing manipulations and, and you're querying a database and you're getting a return back. But it's something really custom. It's sort of really custom to you. Um, okay, so those are the different ranges of. Um, uh, the different ranges of types of data portals we can build. Um, so, yeah, so, so we've got a few questions around here. I know if I'm, I'm probably out of time here, but we really want to get to questions. Um, but sort of as, as we go through this, I mean, these are the kinds of questions we want to start with in terms of our process with the um, uh, with this user centric design process is really understanding, you know, from your perspective, what's the most useful way to deliver that data? Um, what do you guys need to do your own work? Um, and then as you think through that, um, you know, what, if you could think sort of like one thing, like if there's one specific thing that this could do, what would that be? Right. Um, so, so if we want to be successful within the workflows that you guys have, um, what's the one thing risk profiler can do that nobody else can do, uh, that would really enable you to do the work that you need to do and meet the outcomes that you are trying to, uh, to achieve. Anyways, at, at that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass us back to Murray. I know that was a, a deep dive and pretty quick, but uh, I'll pass it off. Thank you, Jamie. I set this up for audience pace, which means that um, you're welcome to progress through the questions at your own pace. Uh, but um, as I bring up the questions, uh, Jamie will kind of uh, kind of host our conversation here and, and kind of, you know, draw uh, draw parallels back to what, uh, what he presented and uh, possibly what others have, have presented. Uh, so hopefully uh, everyone's had a chance to, uh, to get to that. I'll go right into the polls. Um, we have people um, uh, filling this in already. So this first question is really, if you think about Yost's um, uh, slide about uh, what kind of user are you? Uh, this is the question we're asking here. Uh, so if we were building a use case around one of you, uh, who would that be? And um, so we have uh, a good response around 20, 25 people or so um, right now. And, and you can see for yourself uh, kind of how we're distributed in terms of, uh, of how we and what capacity we would most likely seek uh, this information. And, uh, and Jamie, uh, maybe we can do a bit of a talk show host thing here where uh, please jump in and at any at any point and and kind of uh, elaborate on this. But uh, these these use cases are really critical as a starting point, as Jamie mentioned. So once once we have an idea of who we're designing for, um, and you can see it's not a single use case; it's a it's a diverse set of use cases. 
uh, that we need to bear in mind. But once we know that, then uh, the next question is, what kind of information do you need? And you can see that um, the responses here are now segmented by the kind of user that you are. And so this is giving us a sense of um, the kind of risk information that are re that's required by each of those, uh, those users. And uh, I'll let you analyze the, the bar charts for yourself, but um, you know, a key question for us was uh, people's interest in very high level multi-hazard threat, uh, like not deep, deep dive risk, uh, risk models for all hazards, but just kind of a thumbnail sketch of what hazards are, are we exposed to in any given place across Canada. Um, versus, you know, really detailed information about physical exposure, uh, the buildings and people on the ground, the social vulnerability of, of neighborhoods, um, and, uh, you know, really detailed information about uh, earthquake risk, which is uh, obviously what we're, what we're starting with is, is our, our beginning. So this is really helpful. Thank you uh, uh, for that. And, and again, these polls are open. You can scroll up and down as, as you see fit. Um, to answer the questions here. So still uh, segmenting uh, the response by the, the user type, uh, this next question was a bit more specific now. What measures of risk, if we're gonna be modeling uh, the expected impacts and consequences um, over time, which is what risk is all about, which of those measures are most important uh, for the work that you do? And not surprisingly, um, it, it's everything, <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, so there's a, you know, a good distribution across the, uh, the different use cases. Um, and we're also getting a sense here of which specific metrics are more or less important to different types of users. Um, just super to see that, that people are contributing their ideas here. So um, this is a question that uh, I'll pass to, to Jamie to just give some background on, but. Um, anyway, it's, I, it's probably self-evident and you're reading the responses. Yeah, thanks, Mary. So, so yeah, just for context, I mean, this, this is really about, um, you know, how you guys use risk information in your work. So, so the, yeah, the answer to this can help us identify how we design and develop the, uh, the, the, the data portal. This is the kind of requirements that, um, that we use in the design process, right? The, these are the cues that we take to um, kind of figure out what's, uh, as Jamie put it, what's at the epicenter of what we're doing? Like, what do we need to really focus on here? Uh, but it's, it's not completely, it's, it's not giving us a clear picture yet of what, what we really need. Uh, as uh, back over to you, Jamie, this whole thing about uh, you know, how we present information and what form is, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this speaks to, you know, in some ways, the, the data literacy uh, that you all have, you know, so, um, you know, something that is a bit more uh, public facing, I think would obviously need a lot more context and be like pictures and words. Um, whereas, yeah, I, th I think a question for this user group specifically is, it, you know, is it more useful to have pictures or is it more useful to have sort of that JSON, um, you know, data output? So I'll just uh, bring this back up uh, from Jamie's presentation, just to kind of remind us uh, what, we're, what we're trying to focus on here. Uh, the, the range of, of, uh, of delivery, I guess, <laughs> I won't call it a data platform because, um, but I, I don't know what else to call it right now, but uh, the delivery platform. So this is, uh, this is really helpful for us. Uh, these are really crux decisions for us uh, in thinking about what to design and, and try and deliver. Uh, whether we're aiming for you know, the, first, the current first place uh, finisher, which is kind of that interactive uh, exploration of risk information. Um, but you can see that in a close second, uh, really where this particular audience here today is, is dominated by people that use risk information, uh, day to day, so they want access to it. They want to be able to get their hands on it, uh, to use it themselves. Um, there's always a demand for uh, explanation and story maps that, that tell a higher level story uh, to a more general user. And uh, as Jamie pointed out, you know, we can do that with static maps, uh, static images, or we can do that with kind of a, a, a movie style story map. 
Um, so, so both both ways are, are effective. Um, and this is the correct question that, that Jamie uh, posed to us. And you can see uh, from the responses we're getting, it's a uh, it's a hamburger with lots of condiments. <laughs> it's a multivariate hamburger. <laughs> that was great. Super, super helpful, everybody. Thank you. We are, as we're winding down here, um, I'm actually shifting gears. Uh, so thank you. That was our, our risk profiler portion. I'm shifting my hat back over to my URBC host role. And, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of our presenters uh, for their contributions today. It, it wasn't just uh, what they spoke of and showed you here today. It was all of the thoughts and insights uh, that have gone, uh, that have led up to this point. So uh, we thank them for their insights, their expertise, and, and uh, being with us here today. In, in lieu of uh, speaker gifts, uh, URBC has decided to uh, donate um, to a nonprofit organization uh, that provides support for Indigenous youth to become leaders in their communities around emergency management. Uh, so this is a group that is really close to the heart of what we're trying to do. So, uh, you know, as always, uh, we, we value your input and uh, we know that you have to be on the road here shortly. Um, but uh, we thought it would be interesting to, you know, to get a sense of, of, of your reflections uh, in a word cloud here of, of what happened. And, um, you know, I, I love the words that we're seeing. Uh, it, we wanted to get this idea of, of open, openness, uh, data-driven uh, accessibility across to people. So uh, we appreciate that. Our session here today was, was really an opportunity to uh, uh, learn from each other. Uh, we thank you, uh, one and all, on behalf of all the presenters. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to be with us. Uh, be safe, and we'll see you down the road. Take care. Thank you.